So we're here to talk about the Sustainable Neighbors Action Program. But first, I wanted to give you a quick introduction of Sustainable Works and who we are. So Sustainable Works is a nonprofit, neighborhood-based uh, energy efficiency program and general contractor. We create jobs and help homeowners save energy, improve their homes, reduce their carbon footprint, and help finance any improvements they might need to do in their homes. But with that, I'll pass this over to Richard, my esteemed colleague, to go through some of the more simple things that you can do in your home to save a lot of energy and save a lot of water. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about climate disruption. Climate disruption, the language is changing as we go along. Um, first it was global warming, then it was climate change, and now it's climate disruption. And the reason for the latest change uh, in language is that uh, climate change and global warming didn't uh, provide the immediacy of what is happening and certainly didn't provide any kind of action ideas around what was happening. Disruption is a word that uh, kind of resonates with uh, things like Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Sandy. I mean, that's disruption. So that's what uh, all the people are calling climate change now. It's called climate disruption. Uh, we're going to talk about water um, first off uh, because it's an easy target. It's an easy target. Number one, there's a real issues around saving water. And number two, um, using water also uses other energy sources. So as you save water, you're also saving in other energy sources. Okay? Uh, we're going to talk about saving energy after water. And how many do-it-yourselfers do we have here? Yeah. I mean, are you like handyman, like I'm a handyman? Kind of, sort of. I know what a screwdriver is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my father-in-law gave me a toolbox uh, when we bought our first house like 35 years ago. I still have that toolbox. <laughs> it still has the same tools inside of it. Um, my father-in-law has since passed away. This toolbox lasted longer than he did. Um, so we're going to talk about do-it-yourself stuff. And it's going to seem, it might seem easy um, or simple or maybe even simplistic to you, but it's really stuff that you can do t uh, really quickly to save energy around the house. And a lot of it has to do with do-it-yourself behavioral changes as much as it does with getting out a screwdriver and doing something, okay? And then we're going to talk about going deeper and greener. And that's the Sustainable Works set of solutions. Um, we can do so much on our own, but Sustainable Works is a nonprofit general contractor that brings energy efficiency experts into your home. And really, then, you start seeing uh, savings and changes and more comfort in your house and et cetera. The immediate stuff we're going to talk about is stuff that you can go home tonight and take care of, or you can take care of next time you do a load of laundry. OK? So easy stuff. I'm going to, oh, I wanted to talk a little bit more about, um, I, I want to catch up with Neil said here. Uh, by saving 1,300 tons of carbon, that removes 246 cars from the road, essentially. That's what, what 246 cars would be spewing out. But that's also 9,000 home barbecue propane cylinders. So I kind of see those stacked up in the pyramid. <laughs> Um, and we've also saved 5 million kilowatt hours of energy. So that's the gas emissions from 73,000 cars. So that's as if there were not 73,000 cars on the road, 73,000 cars removed from the road or never getting to the road. And uh, how many propane cylinders do you think that might be? 200,000? I hear 200,000. Do I hear 400,000? Do I hear a million? Million. I got a million. Do I hear two million? <laughs> no? Okay, it's 14,700,000 propane cylinders. So that's pretty, I think that's impressive. So, climate disruption, we talked about that. Um, let's talk about Pacific Northwest. I won't change the slide just yet. Any oyster eaters here? Where do you buy your oysters? Or where do your oysters come from? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Anybody else? Yeah? Hood Canal. Hood Canal, yeah. 
Yeah, Taylor Shellfish Company sells a lot of uh, oysters, mussels, clams, yeah. The fact of the matter is, is that if you go to a restaurant just about any place in the world and you ask for oysters and you get Pacific oysters, they're from our region. It's a $111 million uh, business uh, annually. And there's something happening with the shellfish industry. 40% of the carbon dioxide that goes off out into the atmosphere comes back and goes into the oceans or into the waterways. What's that, what that's doing is causing the acidification of ocean waters. What that's doing is disrupting the growth cycle of oysters, uh, disrupting the, uh, the thickness of mussels, um, disrupting the, uh, the food chain for salmon. So it becomes a very local problem uh, because the shellfish populations are starting to diminish. Now this is a $111 million industry and Taylor Shellfish um, Seafood, they're on the cutting edge of trying to figure out how to work with climate disruption and how to preserve the waters so that their industry can keep going. But if we keep on going the way we're going and we don't do like real mitigation, that's an industry that's really going to suffer. And it's not only going to suffer in terms of us oyster eaters um, and the oyster fishermen and et cetera, but it goes all through the line, the food chain, if you will, of, uh, of oyster eating. So uh, it's a local story. So everything that we do has a local impact. And climate disruption is happening just around the block, you know, just down, just down the highway. So I didn't really understand uh, the importance of what I was doing for a living until I heard this story on uh, KUOW and the Taylor folks were telling us about uh, water disruption. So water's an easy target. Water's everywhere. So here's a question for you. Is water a renewable or a non-renewable resource? <coughs> I hear renewable. Well, according to the EPA, water is a non-renewable a non -renewable, renewable resource. <laughs> so that, you, that's kind of like typical government speak, right? We'll get a little bit of everything in here. Um, it, uh, the water that we have now is the water that we have always had. Um, however, the uh, water can leave a region and never come back. So you look at something like the Colorado River. Remember in geography class when you learned that all rivers lead to the sea? Well, the Colorado River stops 90 miles away from the sea. It no longer reaches the sea. Okay, so there's water everywhere, and it's a renewable resource, but there are some locations where the resource will not renew. So it's a renewable, non-renewable resource. 97% uh, of our water is salt water. Ocean water, I, I like our pictures. 2% ice packs and glaciers. 1% is available for immediate use. Lakes, rivers, and aquifers. Does anybody recognize that bottom photo? It's uh, our neighbor to the north, Snohomish. It's their river walk. Beautiful town if you've never been there. You like antiques. So. Um, how do we use water? It's an easy target. How do we use it? Uh, here's the chart. We use a great deal of our water out of the bathroom. And let me see if I can figure out how much here. Toilets uh, use about 26% of all of our water. Uh, washing machine uses 20% and the shower uses 16%. So if you put 26% and 16% together, um, that's probably bathroom use, showers and toilets. And then you add the, uh, the faucets there. So there's a lot of water that's getting used in the, uh, in the bathroom. So we're going to look at the bathroom first. Nice house, huh? I bet they have great insulation. Um, <laughs> and the reason that I suspect that is because they've got this nice room up here in the attic. Uh, so. Now, either it's got great insulation or they don't use it in the summer uh, and they use it for all those pot plants, uh, potted plants. <laughs> uh, that are up there. Okay. 
So we're going to start in the bathroom, just like I said. So anywhere you have a faucet, what is the first thing we're looking for when, you, when we talk about faucets? Drip, 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 drip. Absolutely. Fix that drip. OK. Um, well, we'll go back to using aerator. Let's talk about drips. Uh, this reminds me of a joke. Um, when I was a little boy, I was riding an elevator when they still had elevator operators. And uh, I thought it would be really great to be an elevator operator because he was in a uniform. He had a stool sit, sit on. It was a great wood paneled thing. I said, uh, well, how do you like being an elevator operator? And he said, son, it's not the ups and downs that get you. It's the jerks. <laughs> okay. Drip, drip, drip. OK, anywhere you have a faucet, drips. One faucet, one drip per second equals 86,400 drips a day equals 3,000 gallons a year. That's one drip, let it go. In a year, you're spending $30. Now, water is inexpensive. It's only like a penny a gallon, OK? But if you've got a whole neighborhood full of people who have got one drip that's dripping 86,400 drips a day or 3,000 gallons a year, um, it starts to add up. And if you have multiple things going on around your house, then you fix a drip and save $30. You fix something else, and you might save something else as well. Now, an aerator. Aerator costs about $1.08 on the open market. Aerator will cut uh, your flow in half. It'll save a family of four approximately $30 a year. That's one aerator. So that's your first absolutely easy fix. Fixing the drip might not be so easy because you got to monkey around with stuff, you know, and, and, and wrenches and that kind of stuff. It's not hard. I've done it. But you got to monkey around with it. And, you know, when I do it, it took like four trips to Lowe's, you know, to get the right stuff. So um, fixing the drip, not that easy, but you got to do it. Okay. Using an aerator, very easy. When you're down at Lowe's getting the uh, washers to fix the drip, you can pick up a couple aerators at $1.08 a piece. And at the end of this little uh, class, we're giving out these handy dandy bags. We call them energy efficiency kits. And there will be one aerator in there. Okay. So you can immediately take care of the aerator. So if you fix a drip and you add an aerator, you're saving $60 per year. All right, now what we do when we, we teach this class to high school kids, we tell them to start keeping track of the money that they're saving because they should work a deal with their parents. You know, because they all want the new generation of iPhone, which is what, going to cost around $720 or something? <laughs> I don't know how much these things cost. Um, we, we say, if you, for every dollar you save, you should get a dollar, and that should go into your iPhone fund. So if we ever teach any high school classes in Kirkland and your kids come home to you and say, uh, let's make a deal, you'll know where they got it from. Okay. So uh, bathroom, most water used. Okay. So, oh, wash with cold water. Nobody's going to wash with cold water, but it's a good idea to wash with cold water, especially if it takes like up to five minutes to get the hot water in your pipes, okay, out of your faucet. Some places it does. Um, you get the hot water up to your pipes and out of the faucet. It takes five minutes. It takes you 30 seconds to wash your hands and face. Turn off the faucet. Well, all that hot water that you brought up is in the pipes. And all it's going to do is sit there and cool off. So you've just heated all this water for five minutes, plus used all the gas to heat the hot water, and et cetera. And you could have just splashed some cold water on your face. You know, we're not living in log cabins, I know. But uh, it's a suggestion. Uh, cold water, five minutes, equals a 60-watt bulb running <laughs> for 22 hours. So 22 hours of a 60-watt bulb. You know, so it's up to you. Gas, you put under, we have that problem. That master bathroom is at the farthest corner of the house compared to the, uh -huh. to the Well, I know the gadget that you can buy and put underneath put the sink. The sink yeah. Okay. Yeah. So where, where am I coming? Which one do I come out ahead? Uh, that I put in to keep in that little bit of water warm? Or? You know what? 
we want to be comfortable in our homes, right? I'd get the gadget. You get the gadget. Yeah. It is. It's insane how much water we run. Yeah. We're waiting for that shower. I can, I can make all the beds. I can <laughs> put laundry away, and then it's like, oh, water's finally warm in the shower. <laughs> yeah. My wife was complaining about the water bill, and that night, that night we went to bed, and I hear the water running in the sink in the upstairs bathroom, and it's running, and it's running, and it's running. I said, what are you doing? She said, I'm heating the water. I said, weren't you just talking to me about the water bill? You know, so, you know, you do what you got to do, right? It's a suggestion. Um, uh, wash in cold water, I, you know, I would go for the real comfortable fix. Um, don't turn up your hot water heater. And we'll get into that in a minute. Okay. So let's go to the toilet. Okay. Can this is yes. About yes. What I've read is that you, you turn it on for a few seconds, get them wet, put the soap on, rub it around, then turn it back on and rinse them off and turn it off. Absolutely. About ten percent as much water as if you leave them running while you scrub. Absolutely. Same with brushing your teeth and shaving. Yeah. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> and if you're using electricity, a third of all the electricity in this state is produced with coal. Yes. Think about it. Okay. All right. Um, so let's talk about the toilet. Okay. We're saving water by washing our hands efficiently, brushing our teeth efficiently, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But your toilet. Now this kind of reminds me of. Um, 1950s TV shows, uh, because the toilet, we're talking about the silent leak, okay, which is, sounds kind of scary, 1950s, doesn't it? The reason we call it the silent leak is your toilet can be leaking and you not even know it. Know it. Um, but if that's happening, you could be wasting about 200 gallons of water a day or 73,000 gallons of water a year without even knowing. So. We want you to fix the drip, save $730 a year, okay? But first, we've got to find out, am I really leaking? Is it really dripping? Let's find out. How do you do that? You use food coloring. Uh, there's one color there that I wouldn't necessarily use. <laughs> uh, but the other three colors, I think, are good to go. Um, you put a drop of few, few drops of food coloring into your tank, watch the water in the tank change color, and then wait five minutes and check the bowl. If the water in your bowl has changed color, you've got the silent leak. All right, so everybody's got food. Who doesn't have food coloring in their house? Neil, <laughs> a few of you, okay, well, you know, maybe you could throw a beet in there. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> okay, and check the bowl. And then uh, flush the toilet pretty quickly because you don't want to stain the bowl with blue food coloring or red food coloring or whatever. But uh, important to do that leak. And you know, I, Sustainable Works does not pay a lot of attention to water necessarily. I pay attention to water because somebody told me once that if you like the oil wars of the early 2000s, you're going to love the water wars of 2050. You know, and the water wars are already happening in other parts of the world. And the water wars are happening at a political level every place in the West. So I get kind of excited about water. So there's the bowl. Okay, your shower, your money. Any 20 minute shower takers here? Go ahead, you can admit it. Huh? 10 minutes? Mm hmm? Five minutes? Oh, really? Yeah? Well, good for you guys. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I've been told by teenagers that uh, it's impossible not to take a 20-minute shower if you have long hair. I don't know. I, I, have, I have no way to prove that. So, uh, so let's talk about a uh, 20-minute shower. 20 minutes of, sho of showering, which only one of you does, okay, uses 50, 50, 50 gallons of water. 
The normal, <laughs> the normal bathtub holds 50 gallons of water. So take a bath. You use the 50 gallons of water, you'll relax more. But no, 50 gallons, really 50 gallons of water for a 20 minute shower. But if you use an aerator, you could still take a 20 minute shower. You'll only use 25 gallons of water. But it's still too much water for a shower. So the first thing we suggest you do is slow it, slow it down. So first thing is use a low flow shower head. Low flow shower heads cost about $12.50 at Lowe's or Home Depot or wherever you want. And those are the good ones, you know. And uh, I put one on and I get a great shower. Now, I get really surprised when I go down to Los Angeles where there's no water and I take a shower at my uh, brother-in-law's house and I'm almost knocked over by the, uh, the flow and it feels really great. But I don't miss it when I come back home and use the low flow shower head. The thing about low flow is it's, uh, the shower head is it's putting, it's aerating the water. That's why it's called an aerator. It's putting air into the water. So you're only using half of the amount of water, but you're getting the same pressure. So some people don't like it. It's okay with me. All right. So um, 10 minute, how many people got four people in their family or in their household? Okay. Are any of those teenagers? Yeah, okay, well teenagers are off the charts. Um, we've been asked if we could just uh, install automatic shutoffs <laughs> for teenage showers, and we don't do that, but uh, we've been asked. Uh, if you have four household members, so think of it, if you have four household members taking 20 minute showers, and each shower takes 50 gallons of water, well that's 200 gallons of water in showers. If they're taking 10 minute showers, uh, that's only 100 gallons of water. Okay, add the low flow shower. Well, let's talk about this a little bit. 100 gallons of water for four people equals 36,000 gallons of water a year. So even at a penny a gallon, that's $360 in showers. Okay. Um, if you add the, um, if you had the, add the air rate of the low flow shower head, you'll cut that in half. Everything gets cut in half. Um, and remember that these are cold water costs. Okay, how many people here take a cold shower every day? <laughs> yeah, how many teenagers take it? Well, they should be taking cold showers, but they're not. Okay, um, so one shower head dripping um, is 10 drips per minute approximately, 500 gallons per year, or 60 dishwasher loads of water. So if you've got a drip in the shower, fix that one too. Fix all drips. If you don't do anything else and you've got drips in, anybody here got a drip in their house right now? You do? Yeah? Okay. If you don't do anything else, fix a drip. No, you know what I do with it? No. I catch it and flush the toilet. You know, I had a feeling you were going to say something like that. <laughs> uh-huh. Okay. Great. All right. Fix a drip. <laughs> Flush the toilet, fix the drip. Okay, um, anything else about drips? No, but a uh, low flow Energy Star low flow shower head uh, uses 2.5 gallons per minute. A 10 minute shower uses 25 gallons of water. Uh, a new shower head will save up to $145 a year on your electricity bill. Okay. Your shower, your money. Saves $144 a year, speed it up, take five minute showers, save $72 a year. So now we start talking about getting really close to that iPhone or that iPad, starting to add up, you know, make the deal. There's that beautiful house again. The kitchen. Everybody's got a kitchen. Your dishwasher. You see the bottom picture? <laughs> That's the one we really suggest you use. But, uh, your dishwasher. What's the first rule of a dishwasher? Run it full. Absolutely. Um, any other rules? Run shortest cycle. Your dishes will get just as clean. Okay. Don't rinse. Scrape. Okay, because what's the sense of running a dish under hot water, getting all the food off it and putting it in the dishwasher? Could have hit it with a sponge and some soap and done the job. Okay. Set it on air dry. 
So dishwashers have these electric dryers inside of them, I guess. We just got our first dishwasher like six months ago, so I'm just learning about this stuff. Uh, do not install in your refrigerator. Why not? Dishwasher's hot. Refrigerator's <laughs> cold. So the dishwasher won't have to work any harder, but the refrigerator will have to work harder. Okay. So if you have a dishwasher now that's near the refrigerator, well, <coughs> you're probably not going to move it. But when you buy your new Energy Star dishwasher, don't install it near the refrigerator if you can help it. Okay. Speaking of refrigerators. But one more thing about dishwashers. Um, let's see if I have this. Uh, yeah. Uh, in a year, a dishwasher saves 5,000 gallons of water. More than that, if you're washing all your dishes by hand every day for a year, the aggregate amount of time that you're using up, I'm told, comes to 10 days of personal time. So it doesn't feel like it when you're doing the dishes, but at the end of the year, you've just spent 10 days <laughs> washing dishes. You know, I bet you got other things you can do with those 10 <coughs> days. Um, and $40 on your utility bill. Okay. So the refrigerator, what, what is it about a refrigerator that is unlike any other appliance in your house? Exactly. It's going all the time. 24-7, 365. The only appliance in your house that's always running. So the, uh, do we have these new figures? Paige, did we keep that chart or did we dump it? Yeah. Do you remember the, the uh, percentage of uh, your bill that the refrigerator uses? Okay. Yeah, so 20% of your energy bill is eaten up by the refrigerator in the worst case scenario. I've also heard 25%, so it really does vary. Um, so you want to set it between 38 and 42 degrees, and you want to set the freezer between 0 and 5 degrees, and that's the most efficient use of the product. Okay. Uh, higher, lower, et cetera, you're starting to talk about money, you're talking about food waste, whatever. But these are the most efficient uh, sets of degrees. Now, what about vacuuming those coils? Anybody ever hear about that one? Don't do it. Doesn't do anything. So I'm told. Especially on the new generations of refrigerators, does nothing. So don't worry about vacuuming your coils. However, every once in a while in these classes, we get people, some people who are really, really um, hyper, hyper, or I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to make a pejorative out of it, but they're extremely green-minded. And we had one of these fellows in one class, and he had a refrigerator ha that had coils on the back. Guess what he used those coils for? Drying his running clothes at the end of his running. Yeah, of course. <laughs> we all should have known that, right? Okay, so um, if your refrigerator is older than 1994, you should probably replace it. Um, new models are more efficient. Uh, how many people have a refrigerator upstairs and a refrigerator and freezer or refrigerator, refrigerator and or freezer in the basement or in the garage? Wow, this must be a Kirkland thing. Um, <laughs> No, because you don't ever get that many hands raised uh, in Seattle. I don't know why. Um, yeah. That's true. That's true. <laughs> you got a point there. Yeah. So let me just ask you how much stuff you have in that refrigerator, that extra refrigerator. Much? Freezer. Freezer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. My brother in law had a six pack of beer and a bottle of ketchup. I said, you know, move those upstairs, man. Unplug this thing, you know. So, you know, you know what you're doing, so I won't rub anything in. Um, so a unit in the garage or basement can cost $100 more a year on your energy bill to operate. Okay. So if you don't need it, don't use it. Uh, make sure that the seals are tight. Anybody know how to do that?
Absolutely. So what we tell the kids is to ask their parents for a $20 bill. <laughs> maybe the parents will get it back, maybe they won't. You know, but anyway, yeah, this, the bill test. And ehow.com, which is a great location for do-it-yourselfers, really gives a step-by-step -step how to replace your refrigerator door seal. So uh, probably the, base, the refrigerator in the basement is older than the refrigerator upstairs. No? Yes. Well, OK, yes, yes and no. Um, so check the one downstairs, too. OK. Where are we going next? We've done the bathroom. We've done the kitchen. Anyone take a lay a bet on where this goes next? Laundry? You're right. Hey, uh, good for you. Um, your washer and your dryer. So do not dry your cat in the microwave right, or in the dryer. Uh, is your cat Energy Star certified? Is your washer and dryer Energy Star certified? Anybody here Energy Star certified in the washer and dryer that they know for sure? Yeah. You know, all the new stuff is going to be, and that's the best way to go. Uh, now, there's a lot of debate about this in terms of washing, but I've been told that the clothes get just as clean using the delicate setting as using any of the other settings. All right. The one thing people tell me may not necessarily work on the delicate setting is uh, getting the soap out of your jeans, for instance. Okay. I use a delicate setting for, I do the laundry in my house. I, I use a delicate setting for everything in my house. And I haven't had any complaints yet. And if I hear one complaint, I <laughs> uh, use the right amount of water. So if you're washing you know, a half load, you don't have to use uh, extra, extra, extra. Uh, cold, cold saves about $40 a year. Now, your clothes are going to get just as clean and cold, cold as they are in hot, warm. The reason to use hot, warm is if you've got uh, diaper babies in the house or uh, uh, old peop older people in the house who, need, who have accidents, what have you. I mean, you really have serious stuff to wash, wash it in hot. Or if you're trying to get rid of dust mites. Now, I don't know why anyone would try to get rid of dust mites because they're like all over. You can't get rid of them. But I guess some people are allergic and they need to get them off of their sheets and, and so it's hot is going to take care of those. But if you're not worried about those two things, cold, cold, save you 40 bucks a year, everything will get nice and clean. Your dryer, easy. What's, what's the first rule of dryers? What is it? Clean the Clean the lint filter. Yeah. First of all, it makes it more efficient and you won't start a fire. And if you can get to the one on the outside, try to clean that one out too. You know? Aha. Uh -huh. The moisture setting. Who does not know the moisture setting? Go ahead. Admit it. I didn't know the moisture setting until I started putting this deck together. Somewhere between more dry and uh, what's the next setting? less dry, I don't know. There's a little dot or a little star. That's the moisture sensor setting. If you put your dryer onto that instead of onto 60 minutes, which is what I used before, the dryer will tell you when your clothes are dry. So the dryer doesn't have to run 60 minutes to dry, you know, three shirts. Well, you shouldn't be drying three shirts anyway, but use the moisture setting. I just found out about this. I was wondering what that little dot was for. Now I know. Ah, we all know that there's a rule about how you wash things. You know, you separate the colors. Uh, I did the whites, the darks. Uh, there's a rule about drying things, too. You don't want to dry your heaviest items with, like, your sheets. Because your sheets will bake and your heavy items will still be damp. Okay, if you, use the, if you use the moisture setting, you dry your heavy items separately, you've saved energy, you've saved power, you've saved the life of your dryer. You, this work saves lives. <laughs> Might be the life of your dryer, but we save lives. So dry the heavy items separately. Sometimes the jeans come out and the waistbands are still a little damp. You know, 10 minutes, take care of that. Clean the lint filter, dry full loads. 
Wash full loads, dry full loads. Use your solar clothes dryer. All right. Two dollars at Walgreens will get you a solar. It's the best solar deal in town. Now, granted, we only have 70 days a year that are sunny <laughs> or partly sunny, but you know. And I've been told you don't want to do you don't want to dry your clothes wet in the house, especially if you have any issues around mold, uh, because all that wet clothing hanging in the house can help create mold. Where to? The basement. What's in the basement? Oh, I know what's in the basement. <coughs> This is a uh, rusted out hot water heater. If your hot water heater looks like that, call the plumber. This is not a do-it-yourself job. Uh, you know, the most important stuff about the hot water heater is what you set it at. You know, if you see a drip, don't try to fix a drip on a hot water <laughs> heater yourself. Call the plumber. These things explode. They do wacky things. You don't want to do that. Um, set between 120 and 130 degrees. Lower than 120 degrees because you're trying to save energy, save money, etc. Well, you're saving all those things. You're also creating bacteria. So if you take a 20-minute shower in water that's set to be low 120 degrees, basically you're taking 20 minutes of bacteria shower or any other shower. I just thought I'd tell you that. Uh, higher than 130 degrees, scalding. Now, there are a couple other things. We did an audit on a house, one, my neighbor's house, and he had the situation where the master bathroom was in the furthest part of the house from the hot water heater. And of course, you know, it took, and he had one of those devices, but he never plugged it in. So go figure. So he just figured he would turn, crank, crank the hot water heater up and run the water in the bathroom so, you know, he would eventually get hot water to the bathroom. Well, we did the audit, and when we do audits, we check out the hot water heaters and the furnaces and the stoves for health and safety reasons. Um, and what we discovered is this hot water heater was turned up so high that it was melting the insulation on, on the top of the hot water heater. And, you know, this is a family. This is the mother, father, four-year-old kid. And the insulation's melting so that they can get hot water. Well, after the insulation melts and the fire starts, then, you know, the family misses their house and worse. So, you know, pay attention. That's all. And save money. So um, setting the heater at 140 degrees wastes uh, uh, $61 annually uh, and more than $400 in demand losses. Um, so, you know, it's not only uh, melting your insulation, it's costing you money. It's not any good for anybody. Probably helps melt the polar ice caps. See a drip? Call the plumber. Dink, dink. Office. Oh, yeah. So, you've heard about energy vampires? So, what is an energy vampire? An energy vampire is an appliance that sucks energy even when you think it's off, okay? Now, fortunately, um, if your gadget is less than five years old, we've fixed that. The industry has fixed that. So you don't really have to worry about it. Um, I like to say we've cut the head off the vampire, we've driven a stake into its heart, we've burned its body, we've fed its ashes to the unicorns. You don't have to worry about it, okay? But uh, if your appliances or gadgets are older than, or, uh, older than five years, you need to uh, pay attention. Uh, so use multifunctional devices if you can. Uh, enable power management features. You know, uh, my, my laptop has this annoying way of reminding me that I could be saving energy by doing something. I haven't done it, <laughs> but it keeps reminding <laughs> me that I should. Um, and now that I've shamed myself in front of all of you, maybe I will. Uh, use power strips. That way you can just turn everything off at the flick of a button. And that's easy. So that's the office. All right. Who wants to, who wants to hassle me about CFL light bulbs? 
Now's the time to hassle me about CFL light bulbs. All right. Mercury. There's no more mercury in a CFL light bulb than there is in a can of tuna fish. Well, not too many, no. Yeah. And the only way that the mercury is going to get to you is if you break it. And that's usually going to be in mercury gas rather than actual mercury. So if you do break a hot CFL, uh, try not to inhale um, too soon. Okay. All right. You can take them down to Bartels or uh, there are plenty of recycling places. Oh, okay. So, yeah. They're not in the trash. Not in the trash. No. So they, they do have to be yeah, recycled. Yeah, the bags and the waste bags. Ah. Where's Good for you guys. You said on top of your cycle. Oh, okay. You put it on top of your cycle. Yeah, on top of your cycle. Not in the cart. You put it on the cart. I've never seen the last. Well, I'll tell you my dirty little secret. I did put CFL bulbs all through my house, and my wife hated the light color and took them all out. So I, I, I can't testify as to how long they last because we never had a chance. Uh, I, you know, I don't know. You're supposed to burn them in for an hour. Yeah. They say, and now they say that you don't have to do that anymore because there's a new generation of CFLs that are more efficient that last longer and that have better light. Even in the last year, it's changed. So, uh, because we had to restock all of our CFLs as sustainable work because the, the generations changed. So, you know, LEDs are still expensive. They're your best option. They're gonna be cheaper, uh, but CFLs are not a bad option. Um, and the new generations, you can uh, figure out the lighting thing. Incandescent light bulbs. There has been no significant technological uh, update to the incandescent light bulb since 1905. And in 1905, they put the tungsten in it. All right. Incandescent light bulbs provide you 95% heat, 5% light for the energy that they use. Now, that 90, I love this, I love these factoids. That 95% heat, how hot do you think it is inside a incandescent light bulb? Take a guess. More than 100 degrees? Inside the bulb. The gas inside the bulb. Then the filament. Well, whatever, the heat inside the bulb. 180? 500. 500. Do I hear 1,000? Three to 5,000 degrees inside that light bulb. Can you believe that? That's kind of astonishing to me. Anyway, Edison did it, or Tesla, depending on who you talk to. Um, but no significant upgrade since 1905. Uh, let me go to the light bulb page, because we've got a lot of interesting factoids on light bulbs. Oh yeah, motion detectors are great. Um, you know, you walk into the room, they go on. You sit there meditating and they go off. <laughs> right, you can wave your arms. I'm still alive, I'm still here. Uh, motion detectors are great. Turn on, honey, turn off the lights. Turn off the lights. Uh, replacing one 100 watt incandescent with one CFL saves $6 a year on your energy bill. Okay, but it, go, it gets bigger than that. Um, do I have the figures for the bigger? I do. If everyone in the United States who has a home replaces one bulb, there's enough power to generate, yet that could be generated for three million new homes. One bulb every home, three million new homes. It would save, in aggregate, $600 million. 9 billion pounds of greenhouse gases. You know, it's got a little mercury in it, but, you know, I think it gets offset a little bit here. It equals taking 850,000 cars off the road. One bulb, one house, every house. So, uh, 8 billion pounds of greenhouse gases 
is 9 billion pounds is the same as 457 million gallons of gasoline and uh, 1.757 million dollars is what you'd be paying for the, that gasoline at 384 a gallon. That uh, visualizes out to 20 wrapped pellets. Can you imagine a 20, 20 wrapped pellets? 20 wrapped pellets of $100 bills. I'll take them. I'll take them. Is that, am I a geek because I get so excited about this? Is this how you describe a geek? Yeah. Okay. Windows. Now, all right, seeing how we're sharing dirty little secrets, all right. Windows, the most expensive, least efficient thing you can do to your house. Okay, so think about that. Uh, close the curtains in the summer when the heat's coming in. Open the curtains on sunny winter days if we ever have one. Uh, fit drapes tightly against the windows to hold the heat in. Cellular blinds. This is a great thing. These are cardboard blinds. They actually look pretty good. And the reason they call them cellular blinds is because they have those little bees cells on the shape like that. If those are fitted well against the window, that can be just as efficient as changing the whole window. So, you know, $300 versus $30. You know, so there you have it. Heating and cooling, boom, boom. Programmable thermostat. All right, so let's, tr truth telling, okay. So you're out, because you're a Northwesterner, you're out in the rain, you're doing some outdoor activities, it's really cold. You come in the house, you crank that thermostat up to like 85 degrees. How many people do that? Nobody. Okay, well it's a good thing you don't because a thermostat is not a throttle, okay? Cranking it up to 80 is not gonna get you to 80 any faster. It's not gonna get you to 70 any faster. It's not gonna get you any place any faster. So, you know, it's not a, it's not a throttle. Set at 68 is, is uh, what, you know, Jimmy Carter tells us to do or told us to do. Heat pumps, how many folks here have a heat pump? Heat pumps are great things because they act as your heat source and then as your uh, uh, air conditioning source in the summer. So if you set the heat pump at 75 to 78, uh, when it gets too warm in the house, the air, that'll kick in and you'll get cool air. If you've got a furnace, though, set it at 55 in the summer. It just won't kick on. You'll be fine. Do not ramp up thermostat. Thermostat's not a throttle. Boom. Keep appliances away from the thermostat. Yeah, so you don't want a light shining on the thermostat. That'll just throw the system out of whack. Change the filters. Uh, more off, one to three months more often is needed. Pets, dust, and I tell the kids, hairy little brothers, you know, you want to... Uh, change of filters. Use ceiling fans to save energy. And then we come to your home on infrared. So one of the things that we do um, is energy audits. And this is when we start talking about going deeper and greener. Um, let me just see what the next slide is so that uh, I know where I am and we can get out of here. Ah, okay. So I'm going to talk about this just a little bit. <clears throat> the, uh, the cooler the spot is, the cool, uh, the, well, yeah, cool, it's a cool color. Blue and green, the cool colors are where the, ho the house here is the coldest. This is taken from the outside. Uh, the red spots, uh, the house is the warmest. So this house has got a really a great, uh, well-insulated, no, wait a minute, I'm getting this all mixed up. The heat's, the heat's rising, so this is probably not a well-insulated house because the heat is rising. Okay, so where you see the red, the heat is leaving the house. Is that, am I right? Yeah. Yes, okay, all right. Um, these little devices that you see up in the corner there, I'm told I have a, a uh, Go ahead, I won't do it. Uh, up in the left-hand corner, uh, those little guns cost like 5,000 bucks a piece and they're used to get this picture. And uh, what, when we do an audit, one of the things that we do, and Neil will tell you a little bit more about this, is we attach what's called a blower door to your front door, and it takes, you know how you put a straw into a glass of water with your finger on the top of the straw and you lift it out and you've got about this much water? Well, the blower door takes about this much air out of your house. 
but that's enough air to get the air flowing back into your house. So um, you see all these common air leaks. Well, when you turn on the blower door, the air is going to be coming back in in these places where the air is leaking, and that's how we know that the leaks are there. And you're going to see these blue tendrils coming down your walls like a horror movie. And these blue tendrils are the cold air. I live in a house in the Central District of Seattle that's from 1897 and they attached the blower door to my house. Now, it turned the house into a wind tunnel. I could actually feel the breeze coming past my head. And the wind was coming from the strangest sources. It was like coming from the uh, wall sockets, the, you know, wh whatever those are called. And tell them a real do-it-yourself, whatever those are called. Um, so we've, a t we've given some gaskets in here so you can close those up too. But we look for what's called an exchange rate of 39%. That means 39% of the air in your house exchanges with the outside every hour. My house had an exchange rate of 89%, which they told me amounted to a four by four foot hole in my house where all the warm air and heat and whatever was rushing out of. But we could fix it for 5,000 bucks, so that's on the agenda. Anyway, so that's your home on infrared, and when we do an audit, we won't get a picture of the outside of your house, but we will get that picture of everything on the inside of your house. So uh, that pretty much is my um, presentation. Uh, I hope you got some tips or learned a few things about your home as a functioning uh, mechanism and things that you can do to save energy, save money. Um, Neil is going to talk to you about uh, considering a professional energy audit. Now, it says take it home. When you take it home, we're going to give you these kits. These kits have um, great stuff in them. Well, not a lot of the great stuff. <laughs> <laughs> some great stuff. An aerator, a gasket, uh, some literature, and uh, a beautiful bag. And then we're also going to uh, raffle off uh, boxes of those dreaded CFL bulbs. So um, we've got 12 boxes to raffle off. And as soon as Neil is done, we'll do the raffle, and then we're out of here. Right. Okay. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Very informative. I always learn stuff. I've heard it a, a million times, and he's always adding different things, taking things out. And I always learn quite a bit every time I hear it. Uh, and I'm always quite impressed. There's a lot of different pieces there that I, I can never remember. Now, he talked a lot about the, the little simple things that you can do yourself. but. Really what we do at Sustainable Works, or one of our big pieces at Sustainable Works, is helping homeowners get the tools necessary to make their homes more energy efficient. Um, how many people have a house that's older than 1974? All right. How about 1990? All right. So those two dates are significant, because in 1974, at least in the state of Washington, that's when they um, created the requirement for homes to have insulation, or at least a substantial, like a regular amount of insulation. So a lot of your homes that were built n before 1974 may not have insulation. And in 1990 is when they've really upped the, the ante on the R values, so the thickness of the insulation. So really what we do at Sustainable Works is, as Richard said, uh, talking about the audit, that an auditor, a highly trained home performance professional will come out to your house and they'll spend four to six hours with that uh, blower door he talked about. So we throw the, put this big uh, vinyl door on the front of your house with a fan, it's about this big, and it sucks the air out. Not so severe that it pulls your paintings off the walls. <laughs> like, but. It, it does move the air around, and Richard stole the, the favorite saying about the tentacles when they're walking around with the infrared gun, and wherever you might have leaks, like around your windows, or oftentimes other places where you might have leaks are coming out of your, your vents from your heating system because your duct works aren't sealed correctly. Or, in some cases, you're just missing insulation altogether, so you're gonna, you're gonna see a lot of blue taking over the red. Um, and then, so they spend four to six hours looking at your appliances, doing the blower door test, uh, and then your heating system. One of the big things that often gets mislooked, or oftentimes, 
is, is never caught because there's, there's always minor gas leaks, just like water leaks or some of the other leaks that you really can't smell, but we have a number of special tools that can detect that. So we really try to focus on energy loss and home health quality. So making sure your, your home is, is healthy, the air is health, healthy to breathe, we check for mold. Um, but after all this, the, the auditor will put together a 10 to 15 page report that kind of outlines your home's gas mileage. It shows you how much energy you use, how much you lose, and then they give you a complete cost benefit analysis on recommendations. So say one of your problems is your, your uh, ducts need to be resealed. That could cost you, I'm just throwing a number out there, $150 to retape your ducts. But you're gonna save X amount of energy on your bill every year. As Richard said, one of the, and we really try to keep it on cost benefit analysis based recommendations. As Richard said, windows are the most expensive and you're gonna get the least amount of efficiency out of your windows. When really recalking around some of the beautiful windows in your 1909 home will, will save you a substantial amount of energy. So after they give you these recommendations, we also have a complete project management team that will walk you through all the Pro, all the different processes. There's a number of incentives out there for making your homes more energy efficient from our partner at PSE to um, the state, the federal government, and we'll bundle all those for you. We'll help make sure you have all the tax documentation so you can, so you can get your, your tax breaks at the end of the year. We also do all the permitting. And then if you can't be there for the repairs, we'll, we can set up a lockbox for you. We also have a pool of contractors that we work with that we believe um, maintain a high standard of, they, they pay their employees well, they have high quality of work. So we help you with all the bidding too. So what does all this cost? For the audit, it's usually a four to $600 product. Uh, but because we do get grant money from the state of Washington and we partner with the utilities, PSC, we get it for $95. So. We, or we offer it for $95, and it's one heck of a value. Like, like I said, you get this fantastic EPS report, looks something like this, and it gives you your home's, it's called a home performance score, and it tells you, again, kind of the gas mileage of your house, how much energy you use, how much you lose, and then we'll help you go through the process to make any of the major repairs that you need to, to make in your house. Um, we can sign you up for an audit right here. We have Green Sheets page, can, can sign you up when, when we're heading out here. So there was a question about solar, so I'll, I'm not gonna talk a lot because solar is so dependent on your house. And the first rule of solar, at least in our program and for most all the incentives in the state of Washington is you have to, it's our little joke, you have to eat your in insulation salad before you get your solar cookie. So you have to make sure your home is, you have to get the, you have to get the audit and you have to make sure that your home is weather sealed and insulated to, to, the, to, the, to the highest standard before you can start going down the, the insulation or the, the solar path. Now there's a, there's a couple of different products that we work with. And the, the best product, and you're gonna get your most investment or the best return on your investment is through uh, the Washington made product. And our solar installers really like a product that was made in in Ellensburg, and with that product, you can get up to 54 cents per kilowatt back. So that's the, that's the big incentive that comes from the state of Washington for that. And right now at the legislature, even though they're supposed to be done, there's still one bill that has to do with that, that Washington made product um, incentive that's, that needs to be renewed. Currently that incentive will last until 2020 and they're, they're trying to extend that out even further. Now, when it comes to solar, it's so dependent on your house, how much vegetation you have, um, what kind of, how tall your neighbor's houses are. So I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that everyone could get solar. I'm, not, I'm just not gonna do it. Um, you really need to have the audit and the assessment to, to determine if your house qualifies. So that's, and it, it does, it, it depends on a lot of shade and a lot of other things, but yes, sir. Well, when you say qualify, does that mean that you can buy out uh, solar and still qualify? 
Well, you can still buy it, um, but when, when you're going to go through our program, we're going to make sure you're going to get your return on investment. We're not going to sell you something just because you want solar. We're, if you don't have, because your neighbor has too many big trees and you don't, you don't get enough sunlight, we're going to tell you flat out, this, instead of some people can get, get their solar paid off within six years to 10 years, and it's going to take you 20, we're going to say, you know, that's kind of outside of your return on investment. And we're not, you can still buy it, but we're going to be very careful about it. What's the 54 cents? That's the incentive. So that when you from go. From the power company or from the state? From the state, yeah. No. Can you still sell power back to the company if you. No, Neil? Profit? Yeah. The 54 cents is the. Well, it's a combination, yeah. It's, you, as soon as you plug it in, you're selling, you're selling power back to the grid. So the 54 cents is from the power company. I don't know where they get the money. It yeah, comes back to you. Yeah. Right. So how does that, right. So how does that work? Like, they send you a check once a year. No, I mean you said when you plug it in, you're running it back immediately. Yeah, you your your um, meter will start running backwards. Uh, if you produce more if you, than you use. If yeah. you produce more than you use. And see, right. and that's why when if you call, so if you have too much shade, you're not going to produce enough electricity to sell back. So you're just making a, a substantial infrastructure investment that you'll never. So the average house takes about nine cents per kilowatt hour to run. You're uh, actually producing somewhere around 63 cents worth of per kilowatt hours of uh, electricity. So everything above nine cents, you're selling back and you're getting the check for that once a year. Yeah. yeah. And then there was one other thing that I didn't include in the presentation that will help for the folks that are considering solar or if you, when you do get an energy audit uh, and say you need something substantially f repaired, like a heating system, uh, we do have a financing tool through a local private or a local cooperative nonprofit credit union, the Puget Sound Cooperative Credit Union, and uh, they have low interest, low uh, monthly payment, uh, low qualification loans that are offered, and it's not a new home loan. It's you don't have to. Uh, get a second mortgage for this. This is just a loan for energy efficiency. So you want to put in a heat pump and you don't have the, the cash in, in your bank account to pay for it right off the bat, we can get you set up through a, through a low interest, low payment loan system that is nonprofit and, and backed by uh, federal dollars. So. The uh, Department of Energy uh, gave us a million dollars to set up a loan program and we used the million dollars to buy down interest rates so that folks could get a good uh, good interest loan. Yeah. Yes? What would be the payback on that heat pump over a regular You know, and the, every house, this is, this is where some of the technical stuff gets really difficult. It really depends on your house and how you use it. So I'm not going to give you estimations. It really, it's so house specific. And I'm not going to say, your house, you're going to save this much, and then you put one in, and you'd save half as much and you're going to say that guy was a liar. So I, every house is so much different and really what you need to do is have the audit to really determine those kind of things because they can tell you based on your, your the pressure of your house, how much energy you're losing, all those kind of things, you can really pinpoint how much you'll save and that the ROI on, on the, all those so, different So the audit pieces. will tell you whether a heat pump is right for your house yeah. to begin with and then if it is right for your house, it'll tell you, it'll give you an idea of the payback, the length of the payback. Yeah. Is this the portable dip, or do you also do water heating for solar? Our solar. I, you know, if it, I'm sure we could, and it really just, again, that really is house dependent. We're not going without having the audit, without having, we're not going to recommend one thing. I'm not going to stand here. And, yeah, it could be one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it fits within. Right. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. And when you have an audit, when you, those are, these are the kind of questions that you really talk to an auditor about. When they're walking through your house with the infrared gun and looking at every detail, you can say, I'm considering this, and then they can put an extra emphasis on the report to see if that would match your home and your, and your needs. Any other questions? Anybody gonna sign up for an audit? I have a question. Okay. Uh, with 
Are not. you going to sign up for an audit? Well, I live mm -hmm. in a condo. Oh, that's not going to work. Gonna okay, what's your question? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, see, with all the shared walls, it's it's really hard. Most of our program, or all of our programs, res around residential. So that's what I thought. Well, yeah. I still like change my shower head. Oh yeah, you can do all those kind of things. <laughs> you can do all those. You can put in LED lights. You can do all kinds of great things. Just not an energy audit and do the complete retrofit kind of work. I had a friend. I was live tweeting this. I hope you don't mind. That's why I have my phone out the whole time. Okay. Day. Oh, it is, and then we he prefaced that when he first started. LEDs are better, but they're more they're they're more far more expensive. So, we try to keep things on a affordability rate too. So, Thank you. are welcome. Yes, Councilman. No. No, we are a member of the chamber. Yeah. Why not? I don't know. I can ask that. I don't really don't know. Why are we not? What is the question? Why why aren't we part of the Better Business Bureau? Well, the Better Business Bureau really isn't a. Um, it, it's not the sine qua non of uh, telling you whether or not you're a good business. It's, it's they just rate the businesses that pay them to rate. Yeah, we have great reviews on Angie's list. That's a place you can look for other. Yes. No, no, they can tell even any time of the year because it's pulling the air through. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you, guys. So we may have one little correction to make here. One, which, which correction? The that we the paying the nine we pay nine cents per kilowatt energy used, and they will credit fifty four cents. Yeah. So it's not that we use nine kilowatts per hour, it's that we pay nine cents for every kilowatt that we use. That was the correction. Oh, I just said 54 cents. Yeah. We are a neighborhood-based organization, and we're always looking for, and we're just starting our campaign here in Kirkland. Um, it's, we're, we're, we've been very deliberate about reaching various different stakeholders and building various different partnerships. So we're always looking for volunteers who are willing to, one, get their homes audited, and and retrofit it and save your energy, but two, to also start working on talking to your neighbors and helping me find other people within the community that I need to be talking to, getting me in front of more groups like this. So that's what we do here at Sustainable Works and hope you learned a couple of things and I hope you have a great evening. Thanks again for having me and Richard and Paige here. And if anybody didn't sign up, if you can please sign up on the way out, that'd be great. Yeah. And now's the time to sign up for your audit. Yep. <laughs>